and welcome back to another module of McGill Academy's tutorials. Uh, for this lesson, we're going to be talking a little bit about DFA, or Design for Assembly. So what is an assembly? An assembly is essentially a conglomerate of numerous parts, and we're putting them all together. Uh, think of, say, if you have a pencil, and then you want to put an eraser on the end of it. You're taking two parts, and you're making one large assembly that's bigger and better. Uh, furthermore, this whole process could either be manual, robotic, or automatic, depending, of, uh, depending upon the number of parts in the conglomerate, as well as the production volume. So, for instance, we have modern-day producers like Tesla that are putting together their cars with the implementation of robots and automatic technology uh, just to uh, reduce their workforce and end up mitigating their costs. So. That is a real-world example. Now, for the context of this video, we're going to be examining parts of this assembly here. So we have this carriage uh, on this threaded rod that moves like so. Now, first up, if you want to optimize your assembly, the most logical step to take would be to reduce the number of assembly steps when possible, as it minimizes errors and speeds up the assembly chain. So sort of think of it as having less parts uh, that could possibly go awry or go wrong. So here is an instance of where FA comes into play, especially if you're trying to compare the decision-making processes between an individual and a machine. Uh, so in the case of DFA principles, you want to create a part that's uh, symmetric in some regard. Um, and that's more or less because you want to eliminate the need for reorientation or the whole idea of having to assemble the part in one particular way. So we have a slightly asymmetrical, asymmetrical uh, part here, and we have a pronounced asymmetrical part here. And as you can see here, the orientation of this guy is going to be uh, fairly pronounced and uh, fairly rigid uh, in contrast to this guy, which could probably rotate and fall under uh, in different ways. As well, if possible, we want to maximize accessibility and visibility. Uh, so we want to avoid using small, slippery, sharp, hot parts that are undesirable to touch, um, you know, such as like tangling springs, etc. Now here I've got our original part model. So I've put it into an exploded view uh, just for convenience. And if you don't know how to do that, essentially what we could do is so I'm going to undo this guy. I'm going to select all of this, press Explode View, and you can essentially just drag this guy out. Uh, it'll look a little weird if you switch windows like I did. As you can see, it sort of, you know, disperses it a little bit. But again, you can see the number of components. Essentially what I'm trying to prove here is uh, we have quite a few parts here, uh, and many of which we can deal without. Uh, so if we compare this, this is our initial model, to say our secondary assembly you'll notice this is far less complex and therefore it is uh, far better to assemble uh, there's fewer assembly steps and there's also less risk of failure uh, of course you need to ensure that each of these particular parts are designed well but again that in itself is part of dfm which we've covered uh, some parts most prominently the base so the big block in the center uh, it became harder to manufacture with this change, though. So, again, it's sort of a push and pull effect. You have to very, be cognizant of the changes you're trying to make. So, as you can see, we no longer have this sort of lip here to manufacture. Now we actually have to, you know, incorporate that, and potentially with our mill, that may be a little bit difficult. Now, we also have to talk about the whole concept of non-essential parts. And a non-essential part is, say, in this context, so this is our initial model, uh, a rivet. So rivets, screws, anything like that are considered non-essential parts because their only role is to hold our object in. They don't really contribute to the functionality of our object. So in the context of DFA, it's better to have fewer of them. Uh, again, it helps with assembly because you have less complexity. Uh, so 
as well. Parts should be snap fitted if possible. So uh, in this case, we have this handle here. And what we've done is we've revised it. So again, there's less parts. And since uh, it should be snap fitted since it's significantly faster than other methods of assembly, e.g., for example, uh, riveting and screwing. It also requires fewer superfluous non-essential parts and cuts the expense. So as you can see in this case with this handle, essentially what we could do is just rotate this lad. So if I go back and hold down the right click, we can just rotate this guy freely with one of its edges. Meanwhile, in the other contraption, so if I undo this and we try to drag this guy down, again, they do the same thing. It's just this guy's a lot more complex because we actually have to put this peg into this object. So again, that's another instance of uh, DFM or DFA at its uh, at its peak. Now, we need to talk about this block here, the support block. Uh, generally, when you're uh, putting stuff together for uh, assembly, essentially you don't want it to be very convoluted and difficult to find its location. So in this case, you want it to be self-locating and it needs to be self-aligning. Uh, so it needs to be fairly easy to see where this support block fits in the context of our assembly. Uh, furthermore, we also want its specifications to be as simple and easy to follow as possible. So for instance, this width here was about 4.03 inches. Uh, over here, this is about four inches our revised model. So that's pretty nice. Uh, as well, uh, again, I think this set counterbore here wasn't originally centered. So by centering it, we're making it a lot easier for the workers who or the machinists who are responsible for creating this block. Furthermore, you want your parts to be as symmetric as possible. So on any side, uh, this makes it easier for the workers in the sense that they don't actually have to look for like one proper orientation to put your object. So if we go back to our original model, you'll notice we have this counter bar. And on one side, the counter bar is, so if I click on this lat here, uh, a 0.5 inch diameter. Not bad. But if we go here, we'll notice that our counter bar is actually a 0.6255 inch diameter. That, you know, it's workable, but it isn't great. Uh, and that's because, you know, we have to put this 0.6255 inch counterbar for, say, a side that requires that. And then we need a 0.5 inch counterbar on the other side. So, you know, finding something that fits that or, you know, uh, finding the side for it can be a bit tedious. And it actually increases the time of assembly for workers. So what we've done is on our revised edition, we've just kept the counterbore the same. So in this case, they are both 0.6255 inches. Not bad. As well, you know, it's sort of a, uh, sort of an additional point that you can't really see in these particular models, this assembly, but if possible, uh, in your assemblies, try to uh, keep the center of gravity quite low. So uh, try to distribute most of the weight, you know, lower to the ground. Uh, this will make it a lot easier for workers to actually uh, move because it won't tip over as uh, as frequently. So that's more of like a background thought type thing, but I figured it'd be important to mention. There are different ways to assess your design or there's different metrics to uh, assess your design, including uh, the Hitachi assembly evaluation method. So that's from Japan. The Lucas DFA method, which is from the United Kingdom. Uh, the Boothroyd uh, DFA method that's from the USA, uh, and the Fujitsu Productivity Evaluation System. So each of them has uh, their own way to assign a score to your assembly based on the ratio of essential parts to non-essential parts. Uh, designs with fewer screws and rivets will receive a more desirable score. The difficulty to handle each piece, uh, so tiny slash slippery parts will receive a less desirable score, is also factored, as well as symmetry. So as we mentioned, the score of the symmetrical parts, uh, so if they're pronounced asymmetrical or slightly asymmetrical, that's all factored in. Uh, here we have the Lucas DFA method uh, criteria of scoring. Uh, it takes the fitting process into account as well. 
here's a guide to the assembly score assessment. Uh, so if we go back to our model, so I'm going to go here and I'm going to close this lad. <laughs> My apologies. And I'm going to create an exploded view once again. Kachow. Very nice. So we have this guy uh, spread out. You know, not a lot of fasteners. Uh, so these are our two primary non-essential parts. Uh, so the easier it is to align all the parts, the better it is. So most parts do not need extra alignment as their assembly paths are cl clearly indicated by the construction lines. So in terms of if we go back to our Lucas DFA method, um, you'll notice that these parts, this particular assembly isn't too complicated. So it'll be given a more favorable score in that regard. Uh, furthermore, hidden parts, for example, screws in the internal cavities. So these lads right here, these counterboard lads, uh, they do pose an extra challenge. Uh, most parts are visible since, uh, you know, none of them are quite, uh, we, we didn't hide them. So you can't really see any screws here, but please do <laughs> recognize that we will put some there. So in regard to the Lucas DFA method, if we go back, uh, you know, hidden parts and hidden uh, non-essential parts particularly are going to make our work a lot more complicated. Furthermore, the number of simultaneous insertions affects the score as well. Uh, so in that regard, what that particularly means is uh, the screws in this case have to go through multiple bodies. So they'll have to go through the supporting block uh, and the base. Uh, so this is more troublesome than insertion as the worker needs to hold three parts in place at the same time instead of two uh, if the screws only have to be inserted into one part. So again, that adds a little more complexity to your part. So if we go back, you'll see um, in regard to our insertion, we don't need, uh, so we'll need multiple insertions, so simultaneous multiple insertions. So again, not quite the best thing to have. Finally, the resistance from insertion, so uh, how much force you need to actually put into your insertion, is also a, a factor in our calculation as well. Uh, so if we go back to our model, uh, sorry, it's actually loading, we'll keep talking. Um, the handle needs to be pushed to fit, to fit into the lead screw, the threaded rod in that case. So in order for them to fit tightly, this is a type of interference fit. So if we go back here, my apologies for that loading. You'll see this guy needs to be pressed right onto this lad here. So this is a type of interference fit. Uh, more types of dimensioning and tolerancing will be uh, covered later. But this requires more time and physical effort and therefore leads to a less uh, undesirable score. And that pretty much covers everything with regard to DFA, or at least, you know, it's a general insight into it. So if you have any questions with regard to this part of CADing and mechanical design, please don't hesitate to email us or check out our website. So this was Nima, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video, or at least you guys spectating that. Thank you very much, and goodbye.